Tonight on Revolutionaries. The challenge with technology is using it well and uh, using it with purpose. And uh, very often this is where uh, we have great conversation and, and, and even sometimes where I think um, the, the team, the technical team will challenge the creative team by saying, do you really need this? Tonight we explore the technology innovation of Cirque du Soleil. Cirque is 30 years old and a world leader integrating theater, storytelling, entertainment and high tech. We hear from Cirque Technology Director Matthew Whalen, Creative Director Welby Altador and Moderator Will Travis. Major funding for Revolutionaries is provided by the Intel Corporation. So gents, um, you've both got two of the most incredible jobs on the planet. I mean, I think all of us watching those performers and navigating the best athletes with the best technology on the planet is, is the ultimate point. Maybe, well, you start. Will you tell us how you got there? Um, well, I started really um, uh, a number of years ago. Cirque du Soleil was looking for uh, a talent scout, someone who could really go out there in the world and find some of those talents. So I really started with the company as a, as a talent scout. Uh, sent uh, literally around the world to find uh, some of the best uh, artists in the world. Yeah. Awesome. Matthew, how'd you get here? So, um, I, show business has been part of my life since I've been born. My father was the uh, uh, stage carpenter, the head carpenter at the Nash Art Center in Ottawa. And uh, since a young age, he would sneak me backstage and put me on a seat and tell me not to move. And I would watch shows from backstage. So, I, you know, I, I've always been exposed to that. So I guess uh, it was just a natural transition to go uh, into show business and went to school, National Theatre School of Canada in Montreal. And from there, uh, worked at various theatres and recruited uh, pretty soon after my graduation at Cirque and been part of the family since 95. Uh, and how many, how many technical directors are there at Cirque? Well, it fluctuates with the production. You have technical directors for a production, and you'll have technical directors that support shows once they're in operation or they're on tour. Mm -hmm. So in Montreal, we have, right now, we're, we're, we're a few uh, on d different projects, but uh, it, it'll fluctuate depending on how many projects we have. But we can go up to a six, uh, and sometimes you know, down to four or four, three. Yeah. Same with directors, is it? You, depending on the show, or are yeah. you guys, in, is there a mad bunch of you in a room incubating new ideas somewhere? Well, it's a little bit like Matthew was saying. So you have a number of people who are really dedicated to the shows. Mm. So a number of director of creation who work on that. But also, uh, as is my role, uh, where I also work on the development of future projects. So uh, uh, I get to oversee uh, a couple of projects at the same time. And how does it work? Like we're, we're in the heart of you know, Silicon Valley over here. and, and um, there's a, a lot of VCs, so there's probably, you know, they look at 10 big investments and then they hope that one comes off. How does, how does it work with, with Cirque? Are you doing the same thing, 10 ideas and maybe one will succeed? Well, I think it's a, it's a lot of a, of a discussion and a dialogue that we have between the elements of the technical, but also the business aspect. Obviously, we want projects that are um, relevant uh, financially speaking. Uh, and, and Matthew, maybe you want to talk a little bit about how we, we move yeah. that part of the... So I think, uh, like any project, somebody will come and, or will have a great idea with a partner to, to start a show. And they say, you know, could you, could you bring a show in this venue? Uh, and then we'll, we'll look at it. And then Welby takes the side of the artistic and the dream. And, and I take the side of reality. And, and, you know, and, and just remind them the laws of physics yeah. and, and, and all that stuff, right? So, but it's a good exchange and we get along great. And uh, I think it's very important that uh, we let the dream happen and go crazy because that's what allows us to do this kind of stuff. Because if it was up to me, it'd just be a black box yeah, yeah. And, and a door and it works. You're not gonna start fighting or anything. No, not at all, no, 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 okay. it's, a, it's a great teamwork. But yeah, so we'll develop, uh, we'll, we'll do a full analysis of, you know, can, does this work? Uh, and then there's, there's a whole other department of finance, administration, uh, marketing, even does uh, market research 
research, all, all that boring side happens. And then we do, we do like the development for the theater. Oh, is it big enough? Can we put enough people? Is there is enough room to do performances and all that technical side? And then, you know, well be or other creation directors will come up, say, hey, we had an idea to throw this in there. What do you think? And then we look at all that. And then we try to put that in an envelope and sale pitch it. And I think it's really important what Matthew is drawing here because it's a dialogue. And uh, when we do great projects, I think that that dialogue is very alive and we are trusting partners. Uh, when projects go a little bit awire, it's very often you can find some of the sources of those problems in the fact that there was not a good connection between the art and technology connection. Tell us, tell us about, off the back of that, tell us about the process you go through. So who comes up with the idea of a show? Who's, how does it flow and who gets involved at what, what stage? I mean, I'd like to say that whoever says that they know what the process at Cirque du Soleil is, is probably lying. Mm. <laughs> because there is probably many ways, you know, to, to go through that process. Um, I, like, I like this um, sentence from uh, an author called Eric Mayer, who really talks about creating in the middle of things. And I think in many ways that's what we do. Um, so, you know, there's not one path, but certainly um, we like to work as collaborators. So we like to work as a group and reflect and think about how the project will evolve creatively uh, as a group. So that's the co collaborative aspect is very important in what we do. So, but, I mean, there seems to be such a variety, especially, say, for MJ1, which we're going to talk about in a bit, but you've got music is so critical. You have the athletes, you have, you know, dancers, it seems, you have the lighting. There's just so many people involved. How, how do they all come together? Is it like, yeah, I haven't finished this bit yet, you can't come in, or...? I think, and we'll be able to chime in, but I think when we start a project, right, the, the first person, the first people that get kicked out is the creation director, and then, of course, it's the, you know, the, the, the director himself will be a very important role. And then they, they start building their, their, their core team, so costume designer, set designer, all these key people that will put the flavors to the show. So once they know, okay, this is our core creation team, and then we, we build our production team and the production manager comes on board and he, he takes care, he's like basically the project manager of the whole thing, finance, uh, the schedule, and, and the keeper of the whole process. And he works very closely with the creation director. And then I try to get on board as soon as possible because I want to, I want to be part of the whole process of uh, the, the dreaming phase. It's very important mm -hmm. that I know where the ideas are coming from, uh, what, what sparked this, because although maybe something's not feasible, but maybe there's something else, or I can feel also what was important. You know, sometimes they have a crazy idea, but it's very important. So we put a lot of energy to try to find a solution to pull off mm. uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the dream that they're try trying to do. So that process will, will create the, the first phase is like you say, so we have the team together, then we brainstorm uh, crazy ideas nonstop about what kind of show we want to do. This is what we'll do. We'll do mood boards, you know, any, uh, all those tools that you'll use to create a, a show. And then once that's done, and then we say, you know what, this is solid, this works, mm -hmm. then uh, we take off. We take off on our side and we do our homework. We break it down and we see how, uh, how we can make it feasible. We take the napkin drawings mm -hmm. and then we turn it into a reality is what I like to say. And then, so we'll do that and we'll do the studies and we'll get the costumes. We'll find people who can actually pull it off to build it. Mm -hmm. And well, on his side, I guess you take over with casting and trying to find people. Yeah, because once uh, once we really have, we know what what is the plan on paper at that very least. Now we start to really identify the the, the performers that can really fill uh, those roles. But you know, if I were to summarize, in many ways, you know, well, Matthew will say no, and I will say why not, and we go back and forth like that. Exactly. Until he says why not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, so how long does that take? I mean, is it a matter of months? Is it years? How long, how long does the show take to conceive and, and actually get out there? It really depends. You know, sometimes uh, uh, Michael Jackson was about 18 months, although there was some work that was done before for the theater. Um, other projects will take longer. Uh, I think of a show like uh, Love, between the time that Guy La Liberté started discussions with George Harrison mm. and the time that the show was actually open, that was five years. So it really depends on the project, but I would say that as a general rule, I think that around two years yeah. is a good average of what it takes from inception 
to actually opening the show. And, and is, it, is it cheap? <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, for a touring show, so a big top show, it's yeah. around 20, 25 million dollars. And for Michael Jackson one, for example, uh, was 50 million. So it really, really depends of, of the project. Not all the projects are uh, going to be 50 million or 20, but certainly that's a good reference uh, uh, for a resident show in Las Vegas. It's incredible. I think, yeah, and as well, and that's just for Cirque side for the production. Yeah. And then the, uh, the partners that we'll deal with will also put their investment to to host our show. So the theater, mm. you know, we uh, for Mandalay Bay, we took over the theater that used to be uh, with uh, the Lion King that was uh, there just before us. So once the Lion King left, we had to uh, upgrade the space to accommodate our show. So there's an investment there from our partners. So mm. there's a buy-in by multiple stakeholders. There. And, and would that partner say, you know, I know that the Lion King is going to end at this time we need a new show so have you got anything you know ready to go or do they say we want to create something that fits within this because they're housing it for you it's usually a dialogue so right. a confluence of uh, opportunities and uh, offers that we have and suddenly we see wow you know the Mandalay Bay in Las Vegas that would be a great venue for this particular project so it always depends and uh, I think it's part of also the the, the DNA, I would say, of Cirque, because mm. there is a certain sense of uh, agility that we try to have. Mm. So be open to those opportunities that uh, sometimes present themselves when we didn't plan for it. And how many, how many shows have you got going? How many shows have you got going around the world you know, at one time? Well, including the new baby, it will yeah. be 19. So wow. Curious, which is the new big top, is, yeah. uh, is opening in a few weeks. Uh, and that Where's will it be. Opening? Uh, that? It's opening in Montreal. All the shows, uh, all the touring, the, the big top shows, they open in Montreal. Um, usually, I don't know if it's still uh, the case, but I think they usually open actually at the full moon. Mm. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, uh, and, that's, uh, and then they go on and they usually go in Quebec City. They stay mm. a little bit in Montreal, go to Quebec City, and then tour a little bit in, in Canada, and then they go uh, out there in the world, in the States and everywhere else in the world. We have shows that have been touring since 1996 uh, and so on. How's, how's technology? I mean, it's, it's so critical, but how is it, is, is it viewed at Cirque du Soleil when it's come from, a, you know, I believe Guy was actually a performer on the street when he was starting out. So it's a very artistic model, but technology, how is it viewed? Uh, how's it viewed? Well, on my side, it's viewed, uh, there's two folds, right? and we were talking about this earlier, that technology has its place on stage, yeah. you know, to, and we talk about heightening the, the performance and all that stuff, but technology also is improvement to make something better and all that, so, um, so it'll make uh, our lives better, it'll make the, you know, the work better, the sound quality better, mm. uh, the lighting better, all those uh, things, so, uh, and... Um, so for us, we always try to find new technology to see how we can improve everything. And, you know, and uh, of course, uh, a lot of the time, technology is there to see if we can save money, or you know, or, or make uh, something go faster and all that stuff. So you know, yeah. unfortunately, there, you know, there's that selfish side that you know, cheaper, faster, better. Yeah. And so we have that, but we also have technology where we go, okay, this is cool. Mm. You know, this is a cool effect. How can we integrate that on stage? Mm. And that's where we work. With and frankly, everybody. when you when you think about theater, um, let it alone like circus, I think technology has always been present uh, from from the inception, really, of of, of theater. Uh, the minute you add, um, you know, a pulley, uh, you know, to move some kind of uh, a set uh, decoration, already you have some form of technology. So. Um, I think there's no reluctance with, with technology. The challenge, though, with technology is using it well mm. and uh, using it with purpose. Yeah. And uh, very often, this is where uh, we have great conversation and, and, and even sometimes where I think um, the, the team, the technical team, will challenge the creative team by saying, do you really need this? You know, shouldn't we find another way to do this uh, that doesn't need uh, the use of technology. So that's also a very interesting uh, uh, dialogue that we have very yeah. often. And does it change sometimes your cast according to what the show script is and what your, your story is going to be about? But then Matthew may come up with this technology and, and suddenly the person you've cast 
you know, can't do that or, or, or manage to connect with the technology? Does the technology ever overtake the performance of the artist or is it, you know what, you work for me um, or does it change it? You know, it's, uh, I would say that because of all the work, the preparation work that we do, mm. uh, the casting, really knowing the act, knowing the performance, knowing what we want to do, um, I think this happens very rarely. Um, that the technology will will overwhelm uh, the performance, and I think one of the reason for that is um, even in the most spectacular technology, our eyes get very very quickly accustomed to uh, those effects. Mm. So if you do not have something that moves you, and uh, it's often very difficult for for technology to to. Uh, to be more moving than a human being performing on the stage. So that really is uh, something that's really important. So when technology gets to be in the way yeah. of the performance, it's usually because we haven't done our job very well. Great, so the talent's not wasted. It's, it's assigned specifically to your partnership. Yeah. I think it's there to support for sure. If we're talking about the technology on stage, it has to be about the, the we're always about the performer, right? Mm. And I think there's somebody uh, at SIF that once told me, he says, you know, if, if you don't have a message, uh, you can have all the technology on stage. At the end, you st you'll still have said nothing, right? right? You have to have something to yeah. say. And I think that always resonates for me when, and that's where I challenge sometimes with that. It's like, okay, what are we trying to say here? Because all the bells and whistles won't make this better, mm. right? Yeah. Um, so that's where we, ch we go, okay, well, if we strip it down, let's, we have to bring it back, yeah. Yeah. And uh, elevate the, the number so it's up to the standard that we, we need to be uh, Im impre uh, impressive. And yeah. very often, I think that technology, just to build on what Matthew's saying, um, allows us to make the invisible magical. You know, and that's something really important. We work really hard uh, very often and using the technology to, to, um, to create that magic. Mm. And where do, you, where do you find this talent? I mean, I, I've seen so many Cirque shows and I'm blown away by the diversity of, of people. You know, where, is, is there certain countries? Well, it's obviously not England, but <laughs> is, there certain, <laughs> is there certain countries where they're a little bit more flexible than others? You know, is it? Is it, oh, this country's great for, you know, midgets, and this one's great for... <laughs> not that vertically challenged, sorry. There's, there's no, there's no, um, uh, there's certain pools of talents around the world. Um, there's, uh, you know, certainly in um, certain discipline, uh, when we think of acrobatics, of course, the East European countries mm. have a great tradition, not only of circus, but also of gymnastic and acrobatics. So that's uh, a great pool of talent there. Mm. But uh, we find uh, incredible artists as well uh, in North America and everywhere. So uh, it's difficult to pinpoint. And mm. that's, and I was mentioning earlier that I think when we do casting, we're looking for anecdotes. We're looking for people who are standing out and uh, because those people are usually quite rare, mm. the, 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 the territory to, to look for those artists and those talents is, is the planet. Mm. We have to be constantly, there's a team of uh, close to 50 people in Montreal that are constantly looking for talents uh, around the world. Uh, at, back in the days, you know, like I sound like an old dude now, but uh, back in the days, you know, I would go out there in the world and uh, spend 70% of the time uh, traveling mm. to find interesting talents in, uh, in festivals and, and uh, doing organizing auditions around the world. Now with the technology, yeah. Uh, you know, it's easier because you have YouTube, you have uh, people who actually film themselves and they can send their, their material. But you still have to see them live to, to feel if they're the right person for, for the project. Yeah, is, is that a, is that a, 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 it's a phenomenal pacing, it, it seems, with every Cirque du Soleil show. Is, is, that, is, there a secret, is that a secret source that Cirque du Soleil has that we pace it this amount on, off, on? It's uh, certainly pacing, it is so important for the experience. And uh, depending on the show, I think it's always different. Certainly on Michael Jackson 1, uh, pacing the show uh, appropriately was something that really went through a number of iterations, mm. uh, but is absolutely critical because it's really how you tell that story, yeah. how you, uh, 
what do you want the audience to feel in a particular scene? Yeah. And then what kind of time do you give them to recuperate from that, uh, that, uh, that scene? So really, I remember that on Michael Jackson 1, we literally had a, a sheet with a point of emotions, like almost like a musical chart wow. that would really give us a sense from scene by scene we want them to be here and go a little bit down and here. So really almost like a music, an, an emotional musical chart that I called, uh, that we used to uh, really pace the, the experience of, uh, of the audience. And where, does, where do the clowns fit in? Because yeah. they're, they're incredible and it just seems like a total friction. You know, you've got this guy who's walking on a finger and then there's a guy with a squeaky nose having a laugh. Yeah, and yeah. it seems a, such a juxtaposition. I think also just exactly, or those intimate points, whether it be a clown or an artist downstage where you were trying to intimacy, I think it's fair just to, you know, to say is that behind the curtain there is chaos because <laughs> backstage we're trying to change everything over, right? So and it's, there's also that, although there is, yeah, we're doing a rhythm and it's a musical chart, it's also it, technically we need to make it happen also because we're changing the whole venue. At one moment we're in downtown, next moment we need to create this other, this other set. So usually we bring it down, it's nice and quiet and all that, and backstage, the, the guys uh, create magic uh, themselves, and it's a show uh, yeah. in itself back, uh, yeah. back there. They're moving stuff at lightning speed to be able to change over for the next scene, yeah. and then create the, this next space that we... Uh, Diversion. That we, yeah, exactly. Diversion. Yeah, yeah, Diversion. Yeah. Diversion. <laughs> and how does, how does Guy Lalliberti, you know, the founder, how does he get involved with... Does he let you in the kitchen and you finish and then he comes in, or is he, is he very much hands-on? He, he likes to give um, a number of directions from the beginning mm. and then really step back and let us do our thing. Uh, my role as director of creation is really to keep him informed mm. of our progress. And uh, when we have checkpoints with him, he's very, very involved. But I think that part of his approach is making sure that he has enough distance to provide perspective for the entire team. You know, when you're working on the project for 18, 36 months, uh, at some point, you know, you might not realize that you're right there, you know. Yeah. And it's nice to have someone who have seen so many shows and uh, has really, really keen uh, creative uh, intuition mm. to get in the room and really challenge all of us. And that's, uh, that's, uh, it's really great for Cirque. Yeah, and is, is he, does he do this with the technical side? Is he is he very much more into the art itself? No, I think he, he's very knowledgeable on all aspects, and uh, so he'll he'll ask for stuff and challenge us, and also he sees a lot of stuff. Mm. So it, you can't uh, he'll say, well, I saw this on this other uh, project, or I saw you know, and he's also aware of what the new tendencies are. And um, so, no, he's, he, he's not actively involved at all, technically, but when, when he is there, he's, he's actively engaged yes. in conversations and he'll turn to us directly and say, well, why, why is this not working smooth? Or, mm. So he's not, he's not ignorant at all on those and aspects. I want to add that I think he's really challenging us at mm. every new project to try to come up with something different. Yeah. Uh, and certainly for Michael Jackson 1, there was this idea that with seven shows already existing in Las Vegas yeah. that were more circus oriented, there was a great opportunity to create a show that was going to explore the dance and the movement of Michael mm. uh, in a way that, was, uh, that hadn't been seen before. Mm. And it, it also feels though with, with not just the dance, but you, there's more audience it seems audience participation is, is sneaking in more like the, the, the pre-show, where we all get warmed up the half an hour before we actually see the live performance. There's, there's an acceptance, there's sort of a welcoming that goes on there. And, and then even, even with the Michael Jackson one, you know, the four guys who were actually sitting next to me and my daughters um, got up and then they were the lead performers in the show. And I was just getting irritated that these guys were messing about, but it was, I got totally sucked in by that. Mm. That, that's part of the, the mm. thinking. It's important to find any kind of strategies to contribute to the suspension of this belief yeah. uh, of the audience so that you, know, you, you, you get to really embark on the journey. And I think it applies for even great technology, great experience online today mm. um, are using those same strategies mm. where you really do suspend this belief and you decide to embark into that journey. That's mm. really important. 
what happens if, you know, I'm lead person and, and, and I wake up and I've got flu and you've got a full house that day and to perform, you've got to be the ultimate, even through technology, the ultimate athlete. How, how, what do you do? Do you have a, you know, another team of, um, sort of people understudies waiting in the background? Exactly. The stage management works with artistic and there's uh, understudies for every, every act has a plan B. A different version within the yeah, within yeah, the cast within the cast yeah so there's not like a whole second cast waiting in the wings to yeah. take over but it's more other people can fill in uh, for the for the show so the show can always go on or a uh, worst case scenario is we'll we'll pull an act out if we can't right. pull it off mm -hmm. and we'll you know either substitute it with we'll have one floater act which yeah. is common on tours that can be plugged in anywhere and then um, and it's we'll, really we'll, part of the creative exactly, process yeah. to really think more and more of the sustainability of 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 uh of the show so yeah. starting to think right away of how permutation could happen within the cast do, do you evolve the shows as as they're actually in production change things around totally and it's really important to keep them alive and fresh yeah you can't keep things you know the the way they are so they do evolve because some artists leave mm. uh, new artists come uh, a new technology arrive you know that allows us to go somewhere that we haven't been able to go before so all those elements they do make the show of course the core of the show stays the same you know yeah. the the creative intent but certainly it continues to evolve uh, over time I, I thought I was losing it because I, I went back and I saw O again and I'd seen Michael Jackson one and I went back and I was like, I just don't remember that bit. And I thought it was me getting older, um, <laughs> but it was because you are actually refreshing. And I, oh, yeah. But some certain elements remain of consistent yes. And, yes. and keep that hand holding. And we also designed the show to make sure that um, uh, you can come a couple of times and you discover new elements. Yeah. Because there's, and, and Michael Jackson uh, one, you know, is, it's a rich, stimulating experience. So there's a lot to, to see. You, you probably can't see it all in one, one shot. Yeah. Well, that's a good time. I, I want to switch over to just talking about um, MJ1. Well, where did the name come from? I'm obviously not Michael Jackson, but one. Why, why is it? Is a, is a two and three coming? <laughs> no, no, no two and three, but uh, we certainly wanted to um, explore. We, th this show, Michael Jackson one, is really about uh, celebrating the, the creativity of Michael Jackson and, uh, you know, his music, uh, it, the art that he had uh, in, his, uh, in his video and his music. So I think what we really wanted to do, we imagine a story uh, where Michael was the guide uh, to four characters who had been disconnected from themselves. So they had this power in all of them, but they, they were disconnected from that power. Mm -hmm. And Michael was going to be able, through the four objects that he's very known for, you know, the shoes, the glasses, uh, the glove, uh, and so on, you know, mm -hmm. he was going to confer that power to each of them. So. And by having that power, those four characters would give, um, would create this illusion, you know, would, would really allow Michael to really appear uh, on stage. So really the, that oneness, that connection of love, of courage, of, of playfulness, uh, all those elements, you know, that we really wanted to bring together mm -hmm. that were part of some of the key attributes of, of Michael's genius. Mm. That's what we wanted to explore. So one really encapsulates that. It, it's phenomenal. And, and we've got a little snippet here to show everybody that must buy a ticket straight after. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Outsourcing. Okay, now who wants to see it? Anybody? Anyone? Good, good. We are collecting cash outside, so we're not going to. Were you, were you both Michael Jackson fans? I mean, to, the, the energy at this show is palatable. I, I was sitting with people, you know, who were, who were sitting there crying and cheering, and we we're all standing up dancing at the end. It, it's incredible. So there must be some deep rooted core behind this. Um, well, I mean, I. I I, at the time, um, I, when I was about 10 years old, I was actually imitating Michael Jackson. Um, and uh, I, I got to do those little dance, you know, for kindergarten uh, kids. And what was really funny at the time is, uh, you know, I, I, I was born and raised in Montreal, but I was really born in the east end of, uh, of, of the city where, you know, let's be frank, there wasn't a lot of kids with glasses, no, no. There wasn't a lot of kids who were black. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I would perform, you know, uh, on the music of Michael, and they actually thought that I was a Michael Jackson. <laughs> with a French accent. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that was really, uh, that was, so that was uh, the experience that I had. And of course, you know, I, I, I should also mention, I mean, Jamie King, who's uh, the stage director of the show. Mm. Um, Jamie has actually worked, uh, danced with Michael Jackson. Um, so there was a lot of those connection as well that we could source through and put the show in the right context as well. Zaldi as well for yes. costumes. Yes, Zaldi for costumes. So there was a few of those collaborators that we had on the show, designers, yeah. who actually did. They danced with Michael, Rich and Tone, uh, dance with Michael, and uh, so all those elements, you know, really um, gave us an opportunity to create an experience that was as authentic as possible and so, as visceral as possible as well. Did you actually work with like choreographers that have worked? Because Michael was so precise, He's, you know, it was a holistic performance as a, yeah. as a luminary, realistically, from that side. Did, did you, you, you said you tapped into some of his... We, not only did we tap into this, but what we wanted is the choreography, not only for the, uh, the, the, the movement of Michael, uh, not only influences um, the, really the, the, the dancers, but also we wanted that movement to also influence the acrobats. Mm. So everything really uh, was, was explored and developed from that angle of how Michael moved uh, during his career. And it looked like a, a technological playground out there. I mean, you've got animatronics, you've got manga art, you've got fire, you've got water. You're just mad. I mean, you must have had a blast. Yeah, no, this one was definitely a, a good time because... Uh, but I think for us, where it was fun is because with Jamie King and Michael Jackson, uh, it was still a, a show in a theatre, mm. and we wanted to create that theatre space, but we needed to get that concert feel, yeah, that still rock. rocking uh, event happening. So we got to play with all the rock concert stuff that we never get to play with. And uh, so, you know, pyro, I was like, yes! <laughs> laser, <laughs> laser! Bring it in! Yeah. Bring Those are the parts it. I never said no, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good idea. Yeah. So, we you know, we had a great time, and we, we applied all kinds of... of Everything was pushed to the max, whether it was uh, automation for moving scenery or stage lifts. We created these amazing pod lifts at the front of the stage that you saw, and they could actually, they would rise uh, 20 feet a second. Whoa. And uh, the goal there was to create that pop-up effect that you would see on the Michael Jackson tours where he would pop up, but we yeah. just kicked it up a notch. And we said, that's not fast enough, let's go faster. And, and, Too uh, fast. Exactly. <laughs> and, and finally enough, how artists can, it, when we're talking about technology and you know, uh, does it enhance uh, the, the artist and all that stuff? Well, actually, when we designed it, we talked with the engineers and all that. We said, well, we want to be able to lift 200 pounds six feet off the ground. We said, if you press go, then it'll launch six feet off the ground. And then we put an acrobat on it, and he took off like 15 feet, right? <laughs> and uh, because they just, their body, and they just know how to maximize yeah. that, that motion yeah. and the velocity. So we actually had to dumb them down and slow them down because they're just. They're <laughs> just then you work crazy. out the landing bit. Exactly, yeah, 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 <laughs> on the way down. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so we did that, and uh, sound is, an, uh, is another yeah. uh, place that we maximized uh, the experience because, again, it wasn't uh, theatrical, the sound. It had 
had to really be a rocking venue and we have uh, speakers in the seats. You have three speakers around you, plus... Uh, you know, Every so seat has yeah. three speakers. speakers. Exactly. So you have two speakers yeah. here, a speaker in the front. And, you know, those aren't going very loud. Actually, they're quite intimate. And it's just discreet enough to just amplify a bit that feeling. And you're like, yeah. oh, who's behind me? And yeah. all that stuff. But it just... It wraps you. It really felt this, as though it was encompassing yeah. you there. And this is a great example because this started in some ways by a conversation where we said the goal sonically in this theater is we want to give the experience to the audience that they're wearing the music of Michael Jackson. Yeah. That they're wearing it. So what do you do? How do you design the theater? And what, what kind of speakers do you put, you know, in the, in the venue mm. to really give that feeling? And then, you know, you, you have that result, like the, this number of, of speakers everywhere. But it wasn't overbearing. I mean, you still, there's some viewing experiences where the technology sort of steps in front. And, but it, it was, a, it was a, a set flow. How long did it take to get that balance? To be able to balance the sound and all these different things. So you're like, things. you know, what, I've nailed it. Yeah, I think they take about, uh, because before the artists arrive on stage, um, we're there maybe, we're there about 12 weeks before that, getting wow. everything ready and preset and run. And then the artists are on stage for another 12 weeks themselves, and then we work with them. So they'll work during the day, we'll work evenings and nights, uh, and tweak and take notes and try to, to create. So the whole process in the theater is about 24 weeks mm -hmm. of production time. Where, where we're developing that. But it, it's nonstop. Up till the last minute, we're adjusting things yeah. uh, to try and make it uh, as best as we can. And like we said earlier, it doesn't stop opening night. It still keeps on going. Yeah. We still ask designers to come back every year yeah. to go look at the show and tweak it and make it better yeah. and all that. So it never, never stops. Oh, my God. And the, uh, the vault itself, did you get to, you, you had the whole of Michael's career to, to, did you have to? Did you get the freedom to cherry pick, or, or was it something that the estate said this is what we'll release? No, we really had a. We we only had one big uh, direction from Guy, and it really was to use the hits, mm. uh, and we had unprecedented access from the from the estate mm. to really use, you know, the, the to work actually with the masters. So yeah. I remember like uh, nights being in the studio with Kevin Antunes, our musical uh, designer, and, and listening to the different layers, you mm. know, uh, in the music and how genius, you know, he was able to really compose, you know, uh, those layers of music. So that was a really, really special time. Is each show pre-programmed in a computer or is, it an is there an interactive director? So, sure. such as the lighting, the sound, or yeah. is there somebody doing it? I think if I look at Michael Jackson for, for, for programming, um, for lighting, for example, it is amazing. Uh, every lighting cue, uh, it's unheard of. There's 13,500 lighting cues in, in Michael Whoa. Jackson one. It is nonstop. And, and that's 90 minutes, so if you do the math, you couldn't be going, go, 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 go <laughs> you know? It was just, <laughs> so you basically go, go, and you're like, you pull that. Actually, honestly, we do time code is a big thing now that we use with, with, mm. with uh, Cirque, where it, we use the, the music tracks. We'll use a base time code, so the cues come in, and, which allows for a much tighter yeah. uh, effect and all that. So projections, sound effects, uh, lighting, we'll all read off the music time code and all that stuff. But we still need human interaction because you'll have, for example, uh, where you have music and then, oh, an artist missed a trick and we want the artist to come back and do the trick, well, they'll loop the music back, or the band will loop it back, but the technicians need to have to be on guard. Oh, I can't go to the next cue. So they'll pause the cues, wow. and then wait, and then, or slip in a cue to allow it to come back, and then kick it back into the next uh, loop, and all that. So it's constantly, uh, so yeah. it's not a one-person operation. There's a person to every position, wow. but uh, yeah, it's all time-coded. How do the directors and the performers communicate, considering the diverse languages? Well, we have a number of uh, interpreters. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, we had a group of uh, seven uh, Japanese rhythmic gy gymnasts mm. uh, who didn't speak uh, one word of English um, and uh, didn't really want to learn any English, <laughs> <laughs> frankly. Uh, but they're really amazing artists. And uh, so, for basically, there's a number of interpreters uh, and they, they help. Uh, the communication between not only the director but also the choreographers and 
you know, it's it's a big team, you know, that uh, that uh, you know nurtures the, the 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 creation of the show. If I'll just chime in after that, once we're in operations. We don't have a translator on stage with the artists all the time. Mm. So between the technicians, the artists, actually, the language is, uh, is uh, sign language uh, scuba diving codes for OK, go, stop. Mm. And actually, we use that as a, as a discussion for safety. The all clear, you're good to go. Every, all your equipment's checked. So they'll use hand signals to make sure that everything's clear. So there, there's no miscommunication. Yep. Actually, a good one for you. What is the most difficult technical thing you've ever done for Cirque? Every day, probably. Yeah. <clears throat> What's the most difficult thing? Uh, I think, again, the, it's the, sometimes it's, it's they, they ask for stuff, and it seems so easy when they say it out loud. And, and, <laughs> and then we have to leave. For example, I'll just say, well, we just brainstormed a couple of days ago, and we're talking about these flying objects. And I'm going, OK, maybe half a dozen. And Welby goes, can you imagine 6,000 of these? <laughs> and, right? and I'm like, you're killing me. Like, why, why do you do that? But technology, again, to, what was the hardest thing? They're all individual. I think the hardest thing every time is, is Every show we try to be better than the last one. So, and you have to find your own, a different way to be better. Because Ka was amazing because of this big sand cliff deck. Well, the next show couldn't be a bigger deck, right? right. That wouldn't be better. We had to find another way to be uh, more interesting, not more interesting, different. We need to have yeah. to find a, a way to be different and all that. And I think that's the most challenge. How can we be different every time? And, and basically staying creatively relevant. Yeah. Yeah, you must be sort of subject to your own bar raising or every show is more and more and more. It must be really hard just trying to not only get up to it, but then yeah. affect it. Yeah, and, and at the same time, I think it's really in the DNA of, of Cirque du Soleil. I think yeah. we're condemned to, uh, to really innovate and uh, outdo in some ways yeah. what we've done before. I think uh, the minute will start to, you know, become complacent about that, yeah. I think uh, we'll, we'll lose uh, the, the identity, the, what's, what's really uh, uh, making us all drive. So I think yeah. it's important to find ways, and it does, as you, Matthew just said, you know, it doesn't mean it's a bigger deck, you know? Right. And there's always space for great stories and yeah. always great uh, a space for stories that are moving people. And ultimately, this, this is what it's about. It's yeah. really about, uh, moving and inspiring people. What is the life of a performer like Welby? You know, the hours of practice, how long do they usually stay with the show, that kind of thing? They usually stay around, uh, the average is uh, four years and a half. Wow. Uh, and um, it's, it's, uh, it depends, you know, on, in Las Vegas, you know, they have 10 shows per week. So uh, it's a pretty stable life, you know, that they have. Mm. When they are on the road and they're touring, uh, they they can do between six and ten six and ten shows per per week. Mm. Uh, but it's a uh, it's a life where well they get to do one month and a half in in a city, and then they have about two weeks off, and then they move on to the next city. So it's there's a trade off. But when you're in Vegas or when you're in permanent show, yeah. then you really you come for the show, but then you, the rest of your life, you know, it's, it's easier to, to manage. So you will actually allow them to move from one show to the other because there's a performance in two shows that are similar? Uh, no, they would be dedicated to one show that's only. That's it, that's, yeah. their, that's their back. Yeah, and then they can move eventually at the end of their contract yeah. to another show if they have the skills for, for that show. Do you watch the Olympics? <laughs> and find yourself scouting for talent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I always brilliant. say, we go see like you, the guys who placed 11th, 12th, 13th, you know, <laughs> we go see them and then we say, hey, no, well, I think. Yeah, but yeah, there's, a, there's actually the, the casting team as a, a couple of acrobatic talent scouts and look. that's what they do. They, they go to the Olympics and they go to the world championships and uh, they're, uh, some of them actually, one of our former, uh, he's, still, he's still at Cirque, uh, is a former uh, gold medalist uh, at uh, Al really? Alberville. Yeah, so there's, we That's have a, really a, a big connection with, uh, with the sports world. As wow. Well. And, and do any of the artists actually have uh, input in the creation of the show? They're like, you know what, if we did this, 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 or are they hired guns to do an element? Mm. You want to take this one? 
No, I think, I think everybody has, uh, yeah, I would say they do. Like, any, like a choreographer will, you know, with his dancers, develop a number and the dancers will, will feed back, what about this, and all that. So I think they all contribute. Uh, and also they know the limitations of their body mm. and, and what they can do or, or not. So the director will ask for something and it'll be like, well, actually, I can't get from that position to that position. Yeah. Or I can do, you know, I can propose something else. So I think it, uh, it, it would be a, a shame if we didn't maximize, yeah. you know, the the the, the uh, their talent. Input. Yeah, their input. And they must yeah. have input on some of the technological, you know, like how they are suspended by certain things without it really hurting. Yeah. For example, you know, you must be like they must be giving you feedback, like you know, mate, I can't breathe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My legs can't feel yeah. my legs. Yeah. No, yeah. but they, they must. They you must have that relationship yes. as well. Yes, we do with the acrobatic team, especially. They'll they'll work very closely with the artists, and, and uh, you know we've we've uh, we have our expertise where it comes to harnesses and all that stuff, and we we're, I think we're at the forefront to developing those, and and we'll we'll and of course it comes down to their comfort, maximize yeah. you know what, and even in costumes, the the costume process through the prototyping will yes. be you know an artist will do flips on a trampoline, and it's like oh this is a cool costume, and then we do the prototype, and it's really cool, but then when we put it on them and they do a, a flip and they go actually I can't, I can't see I can't see I can't <laughs> land on my back I can't uh, you know there's stuff yeah. all these little oh, okay well let's change the material so yeah. so it's a, a big process to try and to see what we can do to not affect the performance to make yeah. sure the performance can go to the maximum will you talk about the, the, the outfits a little bit because they're stunning and you know it looks like there's a real craft there there's a big team in Montreal uh, that works with the designer that's assigned for for a project, and uh, it, it's again, you know, it's a big, it's a big conversation because the artist, whether it's dancers or acrobats, they need to be supremely comfortable mm. in uh, in in the, the the costume, and at the same time, when we like a design, we don't want to compromise that design. So it's, a, it, it's very much a back and forth that happens. But uh, the, the, we, we are fortunate to have an incredible team in Montreal mm. um, that's dedicated. We have a team that's dedicated only to do hats, only to do shoes, only to do uh, um, you know, certain items. Um, so that's, that's really a, a big privilege in Montreal. So you, so also, so you mean the, the outfits that they're wearing are probably some of the best quality to make them feel phenomenal as well absolutely so you don't skimp and you know absolutely it's really it's important and and at the same time you know i think that over time we realize that um it's one thing to see a costume when you're at you know five feet from the costume and it's another to be able to appreciate it at the right context when you're say at 50 feet Mm. Uh, which is how the audience will actually experience the costume. So it, it's a, again, it's a give and take uh, to be able to to do to design the costume wisely. It's amazing. What are some of the specific technologies used on stage? I mean, that's as, probably as long as a piece of string. But is there? Yeah, I think every dis, uh, every discipline, like, uh, every department. If you know, quickly, I mentioned earlier on, you know, like stage lifts, so machinery there, elevators that run at high speeds to move scenery. Uh, we use a lot of winches uh, at Cirque, which is a drum that reels a, a, a wire rope to lift either scenery or eye artists, and those go at high speeds. And all that's controlled with the platform, what we call automation control. So those are like, you know, semen drives and all that drive cabinets to control those winches to a console uh, so everything can be programmed there so that's that tech and then you go into like i mentioned earlier lighting i get you have the consoles that can program cues and all that but you have moving lights you have lasers uh, uh, lighting and now LEDs are like the, the the new thing there, and those are great because low power draw yet yeah. high output uh, as far as colors go uh, and uh, intensity. And then in projections, whether it be video projection and LED walls uh, for uh, and high res, low res, all, all that stuff is just like it, I, you know uh, LED walls in itself. It used to be like you know you'd have an LED every six inch, and it was like wow, and now it's like you know. It, three millimeters, two millimeters, and now you have video projectors that are doing 4K, and it's just like, we can't keep up. It's just, yeah. uh, it's just amazing there uh, how technology moves on that. But then 
you'll have technology as well in costumes, whether it be materials and all that stuff in the props and scenery, you know, uh, uh, carbon fiber, uh, all those that we, we apply everything as long as it can make it better mm. and all that stuff, uh, we, we'll, we'll apply it. What's the sort of longest running show you have? Right now, is it Mystere? I think it's Mystere. We're, we're looking at our, our it's PR. Mystere. Rep. Yes. Chantal How many Cote. points do I get for that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Mystere, yeah. Yeah, Mystere 1993. And, and, and any shows where you've launched them and it's just been like, Dum, that's, that's not right for the market where it is or it's been ahead of its time? Yes, uh, you know, it, we're certainly not infallible. Uh, yeah. And uh, there's, I think of, of, of a project like uh, Iris, which is an absolutely beautiful show that we've opened at the Kodak Theater mm. on the theme of uh, cinema mm. in the Kodak Theater. Uh, so you would think, wow, you know, that's such a great concept. Uh, and the show was really wonderful, but I think that perhaps indeed we were a little bit ahead because the city wants to develop uh, that area of Los Angeles. Mm. But right now the audience um, uh, was not was not there for that show. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a show that unfortunately we had to close, uh, although creatively I think it was a, it was a a, a great success yeah. critically and uh, with the audience that would actually see the show. Do you have shows in your heads now or, or aspirations that you just know can't technologically be delivered yet and it's a frustration? You know, is there ideas that I'd love to do this but I, I can't because it takes 18 months mm -hmm. to produce something? Uh, I mean, for me, I would say that if we can conceive it in our heads, then it will eventually happen. Yeah. Uh, either we will do it or it will pop up uh, somewhere else in the world. So it's the, you know, if we can conceive it somehow, that means it's possible to find a way mm. to make it uh, a reality. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what you, what you would add that, to that, but yeah, I'm with other you. than no. Uh, no, <laughs> no, 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 we're done. That's it. No, I think exactly. I think it's limitless. As long as there are ideas, there'll be, uh, there'll be shows. That's, that's all we need. Yeah. yeah, as long as somebody gives me an idea, we'll figure out a way to make it happen. You'll work and make it work. Yeah. That's true, sir, the Soleil style, that. It seems that, you know, the runway is always ahead of you. You can, you can always keep going. Mm. And, and on that note, I mean, just actually seeing the Michael Jackson one experience, um, I felt what you did for a luminary like Michael, it sort of took us one step further to connecting somebody that we can't connect with anymore. And you took us all beyond um, the show, and you took it into a, a lifelong experience. So on behalf of tonight's audience, you're two extremely talented men, and it's been an absolute honor sitting with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. The Michael Jackson Show by Cirque du Soleil set new standards for entertainment technology. Imagine changing the lighting 14,000 times in 90 minutes. There are hundreds of stories like this at the Computer History Museum. Join us next time for the Computer History Museum presents Revolutionaries.